so today we will have three presentations. The first one is entitled A Proposal to Revise and Simplify the Disruption Inter Inter Indicator. And it will be presented by, by Professor Lut Leidersdorf. Although it's, a, let's say, a, a joint paper with Alexander Takos and Lutz Boardman. But the Professor Lut will be the presenter. And I'm really glad that the Professor Lut is for the second year actually with us. The last year he was a keynote speaker. And this year he's one, one really, um, he will be presenter of one really interesting paper and topic. So I will just briefly read a couple of the information from the Lut biography but it's not possible to read everything because it's quite a long biography and successful career so uh, professor, professor Lut Leidersdorf is professor emeritus at the Amsterdam School of Communications Research of the University of Amsterdam he has published extensively in system theory social network analysis centometrics and the social of innovation soci sociology of innovation sorry he received the Derek the solar prize award for centometrics and infometrics in 2003 and held the city of Luzan honor chair at the School of Economics University de Luzan in 2005. Since 2014, he's listed as a highly cited author by the Web of Science at the Clarivate website. So, Lut, you have 15 minutes for your presentation. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then you can start sharing your screen. There should be the green button. Yeah, great. Yeah, you can yeah. see that. But it's not. Yeah, it's not in the presentation mode. Yes, I'll bring it in the presentation mode. No, it should do that. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's now visible. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I want to get full screen. Sorry, Lut, you accidentally mute yourself. You're still muted. So. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. And thank you, Dragan, for inviting me so nicely and for this presentation. And it is also a pleasure to work here with uh, Jonathan, who is an old friend. Uh, so. Actually, I, let me jump, given time constraints, let me jump directly into the water. Uh, my, this paper, which was announced, was a part of a series of papers, of two papers, actually. Uh, and there are two parts to it. The one has now been published in El Professional de la Information, and the other is still under submission in an endless process. Uh, that's the more theoretical one. It was thus rejected by the Journal of American Society of Information Sciences, uh, which is very much a pity. It's a more theoretical one. And since we have now both the empirical results and the theoretical uh, ideas, which are on the background, I thought, let me, in the presentation, focus on the uh, theoretical part, on the difference between historical development and evolutionary, dy ev evolutionary dynamics. And those people who want to really to go into the details empirically, I'll shortly touch them, uh, uh, can find it easily because it is uh, open access on the web. Uh, the issue came uh, to the fore by a paper by Wu and Evans uh, on the uh, disruption indica indicator, which they proposed, that related to an old interest of mine and here you see it, uh, uh, this is the paper by Wu and Evans, and it, it relates to an old interest of mine in terms of um, critical revisions, I call them, and that's already from 1991. And the idea there is a bit different from uh, uh, the new uh, description indicator, uh, which is here, um, you probably cannot oversee it, but the idea is that if you have a situation where you have a sender uh, and a receiver, let's say this one, the receiver is in Amsterdam and the sender is in New York, and there's an in-between station in Reykjavik, which boosts the signal for the uh, sender, then you have a, a situation where, no, where it is no longer important 
what the history is behind the in-between station. And you can completely mathematically work this out using Shannon theory, and you get a revision of the prediction at the in-between station, which is in this case, then uh, you could say a negative entropy. Uh, I have endlessly tried to work with that in uh, also with students, uh, but there is some paper, some problems remain. And it came on the agenda again by this uh, uh, new paper in Nature, where you have the idea that, uh, this is the essential idea of the paper, that a citing paper can be geographically coupled to a focus paper, to the references in that focus paper, or to the or to other cited references. If it couples to both the focus paper and the citing, uh, the cited references in that focus paper, it is a kind of continuity between the first station, the second station, created by the third station. This is citing, it is a kind of, it's bibliographic coupling between the, uh, the more the bibliographic coupling is uh, to the uh, cited references in the cited paper, the more there is continuity. And if there is no coupling like that, there is discontinuity. So there's a bit of difference between continuity and discontinuity. And on top of that, as you see, there's also the idea that there is a different direction. Here we are working with the information flow, and here we are working with citation. Citation is integrating in the movement with the information flow is differentiating, generating variety and entropy notably. In movement against the arrow of time may have uh, not entropy as its generation, but also redundancy. I'll make that point more clear. Time series analysis in, in our field is even more complex than that, because here you see a historiogram uh, just uh, using his, his uh, the, the program from uh, Garfield, yeah, and Budovkin. And if you analyze that historiogram for all the uh, transitions, Diana Lucio Arias has done it in her thesis, and then you can see that there are two directions of these past dependencies. So we have used here the uh, uh, my old instrument for the forward and the backward movement of uh, and you can say that if there is a pass, a pass dependency, uh, with the arrow of time, you have diffusion. And if it is against the arrow of time, you, you, you see the word codification. It means that the things become more clear from with, hands, with hindsight. So we reason, uh, we provide the events with meaning from a hindsight perspective. This is particularly very much to my interest of how do we couple this a long-term interest meaning providing with uh, information uh, communication that we have these two options in time has to do with uh, uh, the possibility that we can uh, approach the uh, the reconstruction from a forward perspective or from a backward perspective and most of you will know from your high school that it is the infinitesimal uh, transition in the 17th century, which made the, book, the two obvious the same because delta t is then zero. But in, in a uh, uh, system like the systems we are working with, with discrete time, and here we have also two notions of time, we can have critical transitions in both directions. Normally, most analysis look with the time dimension. Uh, so here you have a typical picture of SIT network, uh, the program by Ludo and uh, Nejan, where you have, a, a, I think this is the work of uh, Robert Merton. So you look with the arrow of time along trajectories. But the systems which we study are more complex than that. They are not only high historical uh, systems, they leave historical footprints behind, and that's what you see here, but they have an additional degree of freedom where they make a selection 
from the perspective of hindsight at the regime level. So that's what we call a paradigm change or a technological change in the regime. This is not happening in what we see. We see this only in terms of what we fail to see. So where the trajectories break, a regime change may have taken place. We, since we don't have a positive picture of that regime change, we have to theorize it and to test it in the data whether it would have been as it's one of its consequences that there would be a change of trajectory involved. And the issue is now to find a way to design your, the project so in such a way that we can measure both the entropy in the forward direction and the redundancy which has a focus on the zeros, that's what you don't see, but which is meaningfully there. And how can we make that work? And I'm not claiming that I, I have solved this all, but I think we have made progress in it. And particularly stimulating is Niklas Luhmann, for example, in this context, and he's more often mentioned in this. And I'll let me read the sentence. It is, the, the point is in the letter sentence, provides a form of selection that prevents the world from shrinking down to just one particular content of consciousness with each other of determining experiments. So meaning processing is different and the selection mechanisms are different from the information uh, mechanisms, which are essentially natural selection. Once we have a more complex system, like in a system where it's also given meaning, we get different interaction forms. And let me see whether I can show that now to you. So here you see it. And this has particularly come out of the triple helix discussions so that you have the forward sharing of meaning and information, trajectory formation, interactions among variations. And you can also envisage this and also I'll, I'll show you in a moment, we developed a measurement instrument to look at the interactions among selection environments, among the zeros. And that provides you with a picture of regimes. Uh, here I confronted the two uh, ways of looking. Here we are looking bottom up and here we are looking top down on uh, control. The system is shaped bottom up but control then takes over as the system is populated. You get, uh, some people will know that uh, reaction diffusion dynamics and the system can gain a degree of freedom. And we have to, and this is only, it's not either or, it's both. But you can then try to envisage to specify the percentage about what it is still building up or whether it is stuck and not offering new options, but become uh, deadlocked in a specific organization. One minute, Lut, can you? Oh, oh, I'll, I'll sh that's short. <laughs> so I already made this point that uh, in the uh, uh, um, um, in new indicator, we have this point in the minus sign, which is here, let me click on it. You have the minus sign. Does the minus sign lead to a negative here or a positive? And the same we can do with, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it made me nervous about the one minute. The same we can do with the uh, other, uh, and then we come to uh, conclusions. So the data, is uh, specific data. It is uh, co-authored papers with Lutz Bornman and also Hirsch we use. And then you can see here that the, that for the case of Hirsch, we have high values for the disruptiveness. But in all the other cases, we get a lot of zeros. So it is not, we are not yet there. Um, uh, and in the case of the critical transitions, we got a high value for one of Bornman's papers. Uh, I'm a co-author there, and it is also a bit puzzling why we get the higher value there. So I'm telling you something which is uh, in the making, uh, with 
in which I try to work with the notion that there are different time horizons that you can have ne next to a historical time and trajectories within it. You have analytical time in which what is evolving? Something is evolving. And this is a discussion in the literature. Bolding then at a certain moment said the, something like knowledge is evolving. And I think, think it is the complexity of the communication which is evolving. I have further elaborated that in my recent book. Uh, the problem is generated because we study knowledge-based systems of expectations by specifying expectations. So we are talking about the relations between expectations and that's not so strange for us because Shannon type information is also expected information. So we have the materials that we have to take a step from the more descriptive analysis to daring also to specify um, theoretical options which are possible and then to test them as hypothesis. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. I hope things sounded a bit. Because Thank you. Look very much and my apologies to making you nervous because of the time restrictions but <laughs> in okay. the situation unfortunately we don't have enough time for the discussion of all aspects of this interesting research and, and as you mentioned it's a couple of research actually joined together um there is one question in the chat for you which software was used by lot by lut to compute the figures and graphics which are shown during your presentation is that was viewer uh, or yeah. uh, I make my software myself essentially, and then mm -hmm. I use visualization programs. But the software is on the web uh, for the critical transitions. Diana Lucio and I did a full dissertation on the basis of that, and that's that must be. If you don't find it, that you can easily send me an email. The other one, uh, I also very much wanted because I want to have large sets tested. Uh, I explore them first with a queue and then scale up so that the software is available on the web. In the paper, it is mentioned where the software is found on my website. I don't have it on top of my mind. It, it, it is there. And if it doesn't work, please send me an email. Then we will make it work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have one raised hand from Pantelis. Pantelis, do yeah. you have something to ask or you just wanted to be promoted to be a panelist because you're a speaker no, today? No, no, no. I wanted to ask a question. Thank you, for, first of all, for the very nice presentation. Now, my question might be related also to the conclu concluding slide that you had about analytical and uh, historical time, because I'm thinking in these graph-like structures, like in the citation cases, in the reference cases, some trajectories might be moving faster than others. And I was thinking, what would be your take on, on, on this perspective of time? Yes, uh, I agree. So if we have a kind of local negative entropy, the trajectories would speed up yeah, in that negative. Or they can be blocked. Yeah? Uh, and the triple helix indicator can quantify that. Because if it is uh, the mutual information in three dimensions, uh, it's technically, if that's negative, it generates new options. It generates a redundancy. If it is positive, it generates information and it can get stuck. So it can be more or less filled up with information, locked in into its present form and not produce sufficient options to go ahead. And, and this should be tested. And we have tested it a, a bit in a paper in research policy with Alexander Peterson as first author a couple of years ago. And so there we saw that in medical areas in 1952 till 1953, specific medical areas, it was speeding up. Precisely your question. So you can find it in research policy. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm not sure that we have more time for discussion now, unfortunately, but I'm, uh, of course, Thank inviting you, you to continue discussion via the chat or Q&A, of course, with the Lut. Lut, also, you can maybe uh, post the link to your software here in the chat, or if people just contact you by email. Of I, have to, I have to look it up. I don't yeah. have that on top of it. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And thank once you. again, thank you very much for being with us today. So now I'm, I'm going to introduce the Jonathan Adams, who's going to talk about responsible research evaluation profiles, not metrics. Um, and just to say a couple of words about the Jonathan. Jonathan, you can start, you know, um, turn on the camera to unmute yourself and then to start sharing your screen while I'm reading a few information about you. I, I can't turn on the camera because you've, you've turned it off. Just to see. Okay, the loot camera is on. Maybe I can send you the request to start the video. Did you receive the you, question? Yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. And so Jonathan is the Chief Scientist Institute for Scientific Information or ICI, uh, part of the Web of Science Group at Clarivate. He is also a visiting professor at King's College, College London Policy Institute and was awarded as Honorary Doctor of Science in 2017 by the University of Exeter for his work in higher education and research policy. He has carried out research evaluation for agency and institutes in the UK, Elsevier in, Elsevier in Europe, Brazil, Australia, Ch China, and India. So he's very, let's say, popular in the field of scientometrics and bibliometrics. And thank you very much for being with us today and for, for accepting to speak today about the one interesting topic about the responsible research evaluation. So the microphone is yours. Please share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dragan. Um, thank you, Lute, for, for your uh, detailed technical presentation. I'm afraid I'm not going to be up to, to Lute's standard, but I, I hope that what I'll be presenting is, is useful background. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that everyone can now see that screen. Yeah, uh, but so again, I... sorry, again, it's in this mode uh, for oh, the presenter. I'm sorry. We, we can see that, but it, it would be better if it's possible to be in the full screen mode just for. Is that full screen? Yeah, it is now. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to be talking <coughs> about um, uh, one of our uh, projects on the use of profiles, not metrics. And I think that these slides are all in the wrong order. So I'm going to have to quickly go back. There we are to the beginning. Um, and uh, this is building on a report that uh, we produced in um, 2019. Um, and the problem has been that uh, researchers uh, and institutions are analyzed a lot of the time by very simple metrics from publication and citation data. And so a huge amount of information is lost. We looked at four very standard types of analysis and we showed that there were actually better presentations better visualizations, which might look complex, but provide much more information and so support research management. And if you support research management, then you can make decisions about research more confidently. Let's start with something very, very standard. And this is uh, normalization. Because uh, citation counts increase over time and because they cite the rate at which they increase uh, varies between um, one field and another. So it's higher here for uh, clinical medicine than it is for uh, economics. Um, and it's higher for reviews than it is for articles. So we, we always need to standardize citation counts if we go to have information. <clears throat> but the way in which we even standardize those citation counts, the way in which we normalize depends upon the categorical system that we use. And this is often not recognized by analysts um, and, by, and particularly by users. So just looking at the graphs here, you can see that uh, each one of these dots represents the average for five years output from a UK university. The colored dots here, so if we're looking at green, this is the same university in each case. Here, purple is the same university, but this is stand normalized using Web of Science categories. This is normalized using the Australian New Zealand fields of research. And you can see that uh, in each instance, uh, apart from a very few for most universities, the web of science categorization produces a higher average CNCI than ANZ. CWTS, 
um, have a classification system that is based on individual paper relationships. So it groups the papers uh, bottom up, um, whereas the Web of Science does it top down with journals. And again, the CWTS system produces higher average cite cita normalized citation counts than the ANZ. So right, right back at the very, very basic level, we need to be thinking about what methodology we're going to use because we will get different results with different methods. Here are some very standard um, examples. These are the, the four examples we produced in our report. The H index, the journal impact factor, just average category normalized citation impact, and a, a simple ranking from Times Higher Education. What are these very simple crude things telling us? Well, let's start with the H index. The H index says that 28 publications have been cited 28 uh, or more times. And so it takes this entire set of, of publications and citations and produces one number. But a better way of doing this, developed by Lutz Bornman and colleagues, is the uh, uh, the, 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 the pivot uh, plot, the beam plot, uh, where we plot each paper as a percentile, we plot them by year, and we can now see here the full range of papers from this individual and that the average marked here is improving year by year. So we very quickly have far more information. The journal impact factor summarizes all of this from a journal. Far too many people use the journal impact factor for evaluation. It's only there for journal editors information. If you want to know more about the journal, you must look at the spread of citations across papers in the journal. And you see immediately the difference between the article citation median and the review citation median. Looking at here at the average for institutions, it looks as if the average CNCI is much better for unit B than unit A, although it's produced fewer papers. Well, clearly the average CNCI is better, but if we look at the distribution of normalized citation impact, we see that it's virtually the same for both unit A and unit B. And the difference comes entirely from a few papers in a very, very highly cited category. So we now see much more about the institution than we had before, and similarly, if we start breaking down the indicators that are in a ranking into multiple categories, we then compare a number of institutions in a more coherent way. So simple pictures provide us with far more information. What about at national level? Are national metrics a good policy guide? Here we've got the Web of Science document count for 10 years for these countries. We've got the average CNCI, uh, the number of times cited. How likely is it that this makes sense, that Sri Lanka, uh, an emerging and, and very interesting economy, has the same average CNCI on 13,000 papers as the US on nearly 7 million? Well, when we look at the variation in CNCI across years, we see that whereas the UK, Germany, and the US have very stable average normalized citation impact, Sri Lanka's is extremely erratic. So the information given by that average is potentially very misleading, as it is here for Indonesia. Uh, and for Bulgaria, uh, it's beginning to stabilize and it's improving, but it's still varying considerably from year to year. Again, the categorical scheme that we use to classify and normalize these data will make a difference to the 10 year average. So again, here for Sri Lanka, we see how much this changes. And for Bulgaria, according to these different categorical systems, it's more stable for the large countries, but it still varies so that we can see that for Australia, they actually come out as rather better than the UK if we use the Brazilian CAPES and FAPESP categorical systems. These data are hugely affected by collaboration and collaboration varies enormously between one country and another. And it's something we must take into account. So here for Australia, 
The domestic share of output has been declining over the last 40 years. Total output has hugely increased, domestic output only slightly. So the percentage of domestic papers has gone down. These are all international collaborations here. If we look over here for Indonesia, we see an even greater contribution of international papers. So most of the Indonesian CNCI is made up of international collaborations. Whereas for Iran, that still has a very high proportion of domestic papers and only a small amount of internationally collaborative output. So its CNCI is much more reflective of the domestic research base. We need to know these things. Collaboration does affect CNCI because we can see that higher citation counts come from more collaborative papers. These are domestic, single and multi-authored. These are internationally collaborative, bilateral, trilateral and quadrilaterally authored. When we look at the proportion of the UK's articles, only 10% are highly internationally collaborative, but that accounts for 22% of citations. So relatively twice as many citations come from those internationally collaborative articles. When we look at Chile, 14% of articles are internationally quadrilaterally or more, so highly multi-authored, but that's 42% of citations. So that's an even greater percentage. Whereas while 24% of papers are domestic single authored, that's less than 10% of the citations. And for Georgia, 36% of papers are highly internationally co-authored, but 82% of citations come from that source. Whereas the 18% of papers that are domestic, single authored, only account for 1.8%, a tenth of the relative number of citations. So for Georgia, there is a huge internationally collaborative effect. What we're now looking at is another factor, diversity. All of the things that I've been talking about up till now rely on citation information, which is always backward looking. Whereas diversity, looks ahead. We have shown in our latest report that countries with a more diverse research base supported a broader response to the unexpected challenge of COVID-19. So that means that if you have a very diverse research base at national or institutional level, you will be able better to respond to things that happen in the future, new opportunities, new challenges. And we can see here how the diversity of Germany and France has increased to a similar level to the UK. The UK has actually gone down to meet them because they are more and more collaborative and share many of their papers. And here for the BRIC countries, Korea, China and Brazil, and for India and Singapore I've included in there, these countries are becoming increasingly diverse as well and contributing more and more the global uh, research output. Jonathan, one minute, please. Yes, indeed. So what we recommend then is, and I hope these slides can be shared with you so you can look through uh, this summary. Uh, normalization, you've got to think about granularity and categories. Collaboration, how much is domestic and what impact does that have? History is also a factor. Geography, culture, is a factor. These are all going to affect outcomes and must be taken into account. Benchmarks. You need profiles to look at the full range of things that are going on. Single metrics won't be enough. And context is vital. Most research indicators focus on a data set for a target and the identification of research excellence, but there are other factors to look at. Our latest paper is in Frontiers in Research Metrics and Analytics and summarizes all of the things that I've just been discussing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. And now it's time for questions. I see one question is Q&A from Radovan Vrana. I think the Radovan is from Croatia. Uh, citation count has, has never been the 
ideal method. We do not know much, if anything, about practical impact of a practical research in the real world environment instead of counting citations, building network of collaborations, etc. This is especially important for smaller countries and domestic journals, not highly visible in different databases or not highly ranked, but still highly influential locally. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. I think that uh, it's, it's very interesting that more and more uh, evaluation uh, procedures are taking real world impact into account. And that's very important. But in the meantime, many, many agencies are making use of citation data. And so because we run the web of science, we have a particular responsibility for encouraging people to use that citation data in a responsible way. The thing about citation data is that it produces, a, it appears to produce a simple answer very quickly. Whereas the assessment of real world impact is very challenging. So although it is ultimately the goal of any publicly funded research to deliver a good public or economic or uh, social impact, in the short term, many agencies will continue to use citation data simply because that's readily available to them. And if you're sitting in a committee looking at things and you need a quick discussion, it's the go-to. So that's why we say, not just the metrics, but if you're going to just use those data, you must use these profiles and unpack the information to understand what lies behind the summary metric. Thank you. Uh, Lut also raised his hand. So Lut, do you have yes, something uh, for the discussion with Jonathan? Thanks Jonathan for a nice presentation. Uh, actually at the ISI conference next month, I will uh, put on the table a problem which we, uh, a couple of us, uh, working together in this paper, I sent you a copy, I think, yes, you did. Um, where we had the uh, experience that we tried to reproduce something and then we found something completely different. And the reason for that was that these normalizations, uh, which you and others advocate, lead to different numbers in the denominators. And after this division by the denominator, a number in the denominator, like the average citation rate or something like that, it's no longer the top 1%, but something new has been created locally. And this worries us, worried us much. Uh, we don't really have a solution. Actually, in the paper, we, we say we have a solution, but serious objections came against that. But perhaps, uh, since you have read the paper, this is sufficient to ask your opinion. Well, I... <laughs> I, I, my reaction was that, 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 that uh, I mean, that, you know, I, I don't, I, in some ways I don't want to go there with, with, with this discussion because that's going back to single indicators. I'm advocating not using single indicators, I, you know, profiles and distributions that are far more informative. But top papers are top papers. So, so, so however you produce that distribution, the papers that are at the top end, whether you do it on citation counts, or CNCI or percentiles. The top papers are the top papers. Statistically. Yeah. But not individually. Okay, I make my point. <laughs> okay, I see that there is a nice discussion between two of you, and, and indeed it's interesting actually. But unfortunately, we are short in time. The next conference. <laughs> Yeah, and so I would like to remind you also that on Wednesday we have a, a final session about the research impact metrics. I think it's uh, half past two o'clock. It might be useful also and interesting for two of you and for other also attendees in this um, session. Also, uh, there are two questions in, in Q and A box. So I'm, I'm my question for Jonathan is actually whether it's possible for you to stay in the call for a couple of minutes more Should and I? to respond to those uh, questions in a, in textual format. So if you find the option Q and A, you can see the questions for you, and there is the button type answer. Well, I, I can answer Charles Oppenheim's answer. He, so Charles Oppenheim from uh, Loughborough. Yeah, you yeah there is one question. How so we persuade decision makers. Yeah, yeah. So can you respond to them uh, in text and mode? Because we are short in time and I have to, you know, to, to in introduce the next speaker. Sorry for this limitation. No, no, you must carry on. Thank you very much, Ragan. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and uh, the, the last presentation in this session is uh, entitled Position of 
social sciences and humanities within the scientific disciplines and its measurement through a current research information system. And it will pre be presented by Danica Zeldukova from Slovakia. So Danica is the head of the Department of Administration and Operation of Research and Development Portal at the Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information. Her major job tasks include the nationwide collection, processing, and analysis of data on science and research and reporting on them. During her career, she has been a coordinator of professional activities or team member in several national and international projects. And she also represented the Slovak Republic in some international organizations and did as a member of the Euro Christian Board in the past. So, Danica, you have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dragan, for, for introducing. And no, my screen is ready. Probably. It's full screen or not yet? Not yet. It's not yet no. full screen, but so F five. So it is better now. Yes. Yeah, it is. It's fine now. So position of social science and the humanities uh, within the scientific discipline and its measurement through CRI system. It's the uh, name of uh, our paper, and uh, our main question is. Uh, how, how the social science and humanities represent the research portfolio. Our analysis is based on a Slovak current research information system. I will tell something about this system in next slide. So uh, second, uh, second uh, base is uh, some uh, Division some characterization of research and development uh, fields according uh, to the Frascati manual. Uh, we integrated uh, to the Slovak current research information system some code list based on uh, main division of uh, research and development fields. It means uh, natural sciences, engineering and technology, medical sciences, agricultural sciences, and social sciences and humanities. So uh, our paper is also based on theory and methodology of research information processing uh, maintained by the International Organ Organization for Research Information, Eurocris. No, and uh, Slovak current research information data have served mainly to contribute to Annual, uh, annual report on research and development uh, issued by, by our Ministry of uh, Education, Research and Sport. And during the processing of data uh, from uh, this annual report, uh, we prepare some methodology and we selected of indicators and proposal for also for this paper. Uh, what does it mean when I told the Slovak current research information system? It is an uh, information system of uh, public administration, the Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information that is subordinated on uh, our Ministry of Education, Science, Research and Sport, is responsible for operating, maintaining and providing technical support to this system. Uh, this system uh, used the data model SERIF, uh, that is official European data model for research information. Uh, this system was put into operation, operation in uh, 2013, and uh, now we work on, uh, uh, on its uh, upgrade because the technology is now quite old. So, which data do we have? The SK CRIS information contain data about project, about project proposals, organization, researchers, and uh, research result. But not all these uh, enti basic entities uh, are characterized by uh, uh, research and the development. Uh, 
uh, domains uh, by Frascati Manuel. So as part of the analysis, we focused on a research project organization and the researchers. So uh, research and development projects. Registry of project contains the information ab about the research and development activities funded by the state budget and also about international research and development projects. In the monitored year, that is uh, 2019, uh, we register uh, more than uh, 4,000 research and development projects. A total of uh, 50, 100, uh, 81 research organizations took part in solving the, this project. But uh, we must uh, state that uh, not all projects have uh, assigned the research and development fields. For example, multi multidisciplinary projects funded from uh, European grant schema uh, don't uh, contain one, only one uh, field of research and development. So uh, 80 of this total number of research and development projects belong to social science and 11% to the field of humanities. Organization. Organization by research and development Fields. So we work with the subset of our, all uh, research and development organization because uh, in the database more than 2,000 organization is registered, but uh, organization, organization holders of certificate of competence to perform research and development are usually high quality, efficient and active research organization. 7% of uh, them are engaged in social science research and 4% uh, of organization are dedicated to research in the humanities. Organization by research and development sector. It is an uh, important indicator because we find a relatively large number of universities and less private and non-profit organization. 22 out from uh, 32 Slovak universities declare mostly a social science and humanities sciences pro profile. I, uh, we think uh, that uh, it is uh, not correct because the university has a uh, faculty of um, natural sciences, uh, technical faculties, and not only predominant one in social science and humanities. So we think, um, high education sector is a bit overestimated in our table. If we consider the, the faculty as a, an independent body, like an university, share of social science and human disorganization in the total number would slightly decrease. And the who is involved to SSH project? Small number of organization, social science uh, contains uh, uh, 54 and a humanities organization is, I uh, cannot see this number. So it's uh, a bit uh, less. Um, address a relatively higher shape of projects. So why? We have uh, two possibly explanation. Social science and humanities organization real, realized more than average number of projects. It is uh, first possibly reason. And second reason is that the organization declaring another group of research and development field than uh, social science, science and humanities. So how many projects are solved by the research and development organization? In uh, 2011, a total of uh, 1,127 social science and humanities projects were solved. And uh, they were solved by a total of uh, 186 organizations. So one organization participates 
on average in six projects in this year. And these organizations were involved in the solution of project uh, uh, at least uh, 2,000 times. So several projects were solved in cooperation, at least two organizations. And uh, how we know this data? Uh, of course, uh, the portal uh, don't allow to receive this data. We use also uh, SQL database, uh, database tools, so mainly select command. And uh, how many organizations saw project in accordance with uh, their research profile? Of the our 186 involved organization in uh, social science and humanities pro projects, uh, 131 has a social science and human or humanities profile, profile, and 55 are other than social science and humanity profile. It means 30% uh, percent of involved organization have other than social science or humanities profile. So we can, we can tell that uh, organization, not only social science and uh, humanities organizations solve these projects. And uh, what about researchers by research and development fields? The register of researchers contains records of researchers, but uh, also of uh, support and administri administrative staff and the uh, staff of scientific and technical services. And uh, research staff uh, do not enter the research and development field of organization. So the number of researchers uh, by groups of research and development fields does not correspond to the total number of registered researchers. That is more than uh, 34,000 in the register. So 24% uh, of uh, researchers are involved in social science and 12% uh, in humanities representing a total of uh, more than uh, 8,000 individuals. So conclusion, in uh, 2019, uh, more than uh, 1,100 projects in social science and humanities were solved. It is 29% uh, of uh, the total number of realized projects. So uh, we can state that uh, it cannot, uh, social science and humanities uh, don't play marginal role in, activity, in research activities in uh, this year. The share of, share of uh, social science and humanities organization of, uh, on all research organization is only 11%. So we state that uh, 186 research and development organization participate uh, on uh, social science and humanities project is 32% uh, of all organization involved to this project in uh, 2019. So when 32% uh, organization are involved to 29 projects, the share is proportional. So it is interesting that 30% uh, of uh, organization involved to the social science and humanities project has, uh, have other author research, uh, author, author than social science and humanities research profile. It means involvement to the social science and humanities project it is not just a domain of uh, SSH profile organization. So it is, uh, it is uh, finally answer to our question. We summarize the involvement is not just a domain of uh, social science and humanities profile organization, and it is not, nothing new. 
that uh, project solution uh, require multidisciplinary cooperation. But uh, we see also a strong societal impact in the challenges for all research and development disciplines. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you have any question, so don't hesitate and ask. So yes. any question for, for Danica, you can raise your hand, you can put the question in Q&A or in, in the chat box. So for me, it was a little bit surprising at the end uh, related to the conclusion because I heard a lot of, you know, um, complaints from, for, from the people from SSH domain that uh, they are somehow, their contribution is not well recognized by, by some mm -hmm. policy makers, by some funding organizations and so on. But it seems it's not the case according to your um, research. So I'm not coming from SSH field, I'm from ICT field, but I hope at least that this conference could be one instrument to, to raise the, their voice and to say why they think uh, they should be evaluated in some different way and they should be funded in separated funding calls and so on. So that was just uh, the comment from my experience in, in the discussion with the people from SSH field that they are usually feel as they are um, not well recognized and their uh, significant uh, contribution for the community itself is not based, um, that is uh, that are dedicated for university and the uh, slovak academy of science uh, yes. but uh, probably not all uh, international projects mm -hmm. could be entered uh, data in uh, sk chris system Mm -hmm. Probably this could, uh, I don't know, it is an uh, important amount of this project, but uh, I am not sure that uh, there is, uh, there are registered all projects. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, but, and maybe also, you know, the, the situation in Slovakia is different. Maybe they, the, the government, you're better recognized uh, the, the, the importance of social science and humanities. and better balance the, the fundings for, for the complete community and, and include also the you know social science and humanities departments in, in funding better than other countries. Probably so, maybe, so. So maybe it's just you know a local conclusion. Maybe it's not a, a global conclusion for, for